Oh, lead us from the unreal to the real, from darkness unto light, lead us from death to immortality. Oh, peace, peace, peace. Now, let us begin with that little meditation. It's the 24th verse. I'll just recite it and then we'll have a little meditation. Kama dhyashtita gadrishya tat sakshitve na chetanam dhyaye drishyanu vidhoyam samadhisa vikalpaka Every thought that comes into my mind Good thought, bad thought, religious thought, not particularly religious thought, does not matter. The examples he gives, desire, or greed, or anger, or holy thoughts, or calmness, or peace of mind, whatever comes to my mind, let me use that to become aware that I am the witness of that thought. Don't try to be the witness of that thought. Just recognize the fact that you are the witness of that thought. After all, in whose light is that thought shining? You are the consciousness in which the thought arises. And then go to the second stage. Having become aware of yourself as the witness consciousness. What is this witness consciousness? 25th verse. Asanga Satchidananda Swaprabho Dvaita Varjita Asmiti Shabda Vidhoyam Samadhisa Vikalpaka This witness consciousness is completely unattached. Whatever the circumstances of the world outside, of my own body, of the mind, it comes and goes like the vast blue sky overhead where clouds come and go, go different shapes, different colors, different types of clouds. They come and they go. Sometimes there are no clouds, sometimes heavy and dark, sometimes white fluffy clouds. And the vast blue is completely unaffected by that. It's completely unaffected by the clouds passing through the sky. In the same way, you are the sky of consciousness in which the world, the body, thoughts, all of them arise and pass away. Completely unattached. Luminous, without a second, existence consciousness place. For two minutes, let us meditate on that. Slowly open your eyes. Another advantage of this meditation is, in a yogic meditation, when I'm trying to meditate on a deity, like say Krishna. Now I have thought of Krishna and maybe the name Krishna in my mind. And it's a struggle to hold on to that. Because every other thought that arises in the mind is a rival to that thought. I have to push out those thoughts and replace it with Krishna. A sound comes. It's a distraction from Krishna. You're lucky you don't have mosquitoes. In India, when you're meditating on Krishna, invariably the, the demons, there are no demons in this, this age, but they have all become mosquitoes. And they'll come and try to distract you. The great sadhaka or sadhika, the spiritual practitioner meditating on Krishna. So that's a distraction. Every other movement of the mind is a distraction when you're trying to meditate on the deity the traditional method of yogic meditation. In the, this method, Vedantic meditation, every distraction is welcome. It only serves to remind you in what light is it shining? You the witness. So 
Suppose you do not even think about that, you forget to think about that. It doesn't matter, the moment you recall that, good enough. So, this is one advantage. Everything that can be a distraction in the other kind of meditation becomes an aid here. You can develop the skill. Alright. Now let's go back to the text. We have done the first verse and some of you may be wondering, at this rate, however is he going to complete the text? One verse took more than an hour. Well, don't worry. Now the next four verses, two, three, four, five, are going to go by just like that. Because they are, you will find they have already covered that ground thoroughly. They are nothing other than an explanation of the first verse. The first verse, I told you there are four stages. The second verse explains the first stage. The third verse explains the second stage. The fourth verse will explain the uh, uh, third stage. And the fifth verse will explain the fourth, fourth stage. So the four stages which we came across in the first verse are simply being uh, explained here. Verse number two. Please repeat after me. Neela Bita Stula Sokshma Neela Bita Stula Sokshma Raswa Dirgha Di Bhedata Raswa Dirgha Di Bhedata Nana Vidha Nirupani Nana Vidha Nirupani Pashyet Lochana Mekadha it's explaining the first stage. What does it say? The eyes by themselves are the seer. And what do they see? So many types of colors. Neela, blue or dark. Pita, yellow. They see so many kinds of forms. Stula, gross. Here is a big mountain. Sukshma. There is the floating with the, the water, shimmering in the sunlight. Same eyes are seen. Raswa, short. Dirgha, long or tall. Ali, Bhedata, etc. Variety of forms are being seen by the same pair of eyes. <coughs> Nana Vidhani Rupani, a variety of forms, colors, are being seen by the same pair of eyes. Pashyet Lochanam Ekadha. By itself, the eyes are seen. So the eyes are the seer and the forms are the seen. And what do we remember? The seer and the seen are different. The seer is one, the seen are many. The seer is relatively unchanging, the seen are continuously changing. That's it. Easy. <laughs> number three, verse number three. We now go to stage two. Andhya Mandya Patutveshu Andhya Mandya Patutveshu Netra Dharmeshu Chaikadha Netra Dharmeshu Chaikadha Sankalpaid Manashrotra Sankalpaid Manashrotra Tvagado Yodhyatamidam what does it mean? Now the eyes become the seen and the mind becomes the seer. Stage 2. Andhya mandhya patutveshu. Eyes are blind. I can't, can't see. I need a cataract operation. Mandhya. I need glasses. I can't see well. Patu. 20-20 vision. I can see very well. Who understands all this about her own eyes? The mind. Netra dharme shuchaikadha. All the qualities, the aspects, the characteristics of the eyes by itself, ekada, by itself, sankalpait mana, the mind thinks, understands, cognizes. True. And again, let us apply the same things. The seer and the seen are different. The mind is different from the eyes. The conditions of the seen are many. Sometimes you can see well, sometimes you cannot see well. The same mind understands. And the seen are many, not only the eyes, ears, nose, skin, the physical body, all of this becomes the seen. And it is the same mind which is seen. 
Sankalpayet mana, the mind sees. And he says, Shrotra Tvagadu Yodjatamidam. Extend this reasoning to ears, skin, nose, taste, all the five sense organs. Same reasoning. They are all the seen and the mind is their seer. They are all objects which appear in the mind. We, we can experience, we, we understand them, experience them in the mind. They are all separate from the mind. Number one, they are, they are many, the mind is one. Comparatively. They change in many ways, the mind relatively unchanging understands them. Done. <laughs> Stage two. Stage 3, here is an interesting thing that happens. The real magic starts happening here. Up to stage 2, it's, it's common knowledge. Stage 3 is fourth verse. Kama Sankalpa Sandeho Kama Sankalpa Sandeho Shraddha Shraddhe Dhriti Tare Shraddha Shraddhe Dhriti Tare Dhir Dhir Sorry, this, this should be together. Rir dir virit geva madhin. Rir dir virit geva madhin. Vasayate kadachiti. Vasayate kadachiti. Verse number four says. Now the mind itself becomes the seer and the witness is the seer. What is the mind after all? Thoughts, feelings, emotions, ideas, memories. This is the mind. He says karma, desire comes. I want this. It's a thought in the mind. Are you not aware of it? Something is aware inside us. Is aware of the desire in the mind. Sankalpa, uh, determination, makes a determination. This is a nice thing. So that's a sankalpa, a thought about something. Sandeha, a doubt, not very clear, what is he saying? But am I not aware of the doubt in the mind? That's all. If somebody doubts, Shankaracharya writes in one of his commentaries, if somebody doubts the existence of this Atman, pure consciousness within, it is the very Atman of the one who doubts. The one who says there is no such thing, all this is just, um, you know, it's a bluff, it's just fancy theory. There's no such thing as a witness. Show me the witness. Where is the witness? Uh, there's no such thing. And Shankaracharya says, it is the witness, the very self of that very person who is doubting. It's because of the light of the witness, it's because of consciousness that he can express, he can feel a doubt. It's actually, if you understand it in its own terms, it's irrefutable. It's powerful, sim simple, and you can't get out of it. I remember I was on a flight with this uh, neuroscientist, a lady who was flying from, um, from England to India for a neuroscience conference. A young researcher in neuroscience. And she was sitting next to me for part of the journey. And uh, we started talking and then she saw that I was a monk. She was interested. She said, I'm an Anglican, but I don't believe. I mean, I'm a non-practicing Anglican. Then I started talking to her about Vedanta. And this idea of the consciousness, which witnesses the changes of the body, mind, all our experiences. And she listened carefully, very sharp, and she got it. We were, I, was speaking, I spoke to her about 45 minutes or one hour. And then, yeah, a full talk. A Vedanta talk. Um, and the funny thing happened after, after the flight. Uh, but she, she got it and she said something interesting. She said, look. I am not convinced what you are saying, but I can't find a fault in this. I can't see where it goes wrong anywhere, but I, I can't bring myself to believe it or to be convinced about it, but it's faultless. Remember, this person is a thoroughgoing materialist, reductionist, uh, you know, a neuroscientist who has to explain everything in terms of the brain matter. And she says that I can't, I can't refute this. It's not, I mean, where is the fault in this? Though you are not, you have not convinced me. And then after the flight, when we got down, I met her in the airport. It was in Munich airport. 
and uh, she said to me, well, you know, Swami, I'm terribly scared of flying. So if I see somebody interesting sitting next to me, I engage that person in conversation. So the flight goes on very nicely. <laughs> so that's what she was doing. <laughs> the flight stewardesses, and they all came around, sat around me, and I, there were some seats which were empty. And he said, please tell us 10 minutes, the, the purpose of life. <laughs> so I gave them a short talk on the purpose of life. And the funny thing was when I came back to Belurman, the headquarters afterwards, and I mentioned this to the general secretary at that time, Swami Prabhupada He laughed and he said, I have, till now I had heard of the Sermon on the Mount, but now this is a Sermon on the Air. <laughs> <laughs> and there were some other funny such things, but anyway. So, the karma, desire, sankalpa, thought, sandeha, doubt, shraddha, faith, I believe this, or I believe in God, or I believe in this or that, whatever, shraddha, I have faith, ashraddha, I have no faith, I don't believe, I just, uh, I mean, I can't believe any, any of this, very good, take that thought, it shines in the light of consciousness, can you deny it? It arises in consciousness, what else is it? What competing explanation is there? In no philosophy, religion, or science, or uh, neuroscience, you will find even an alternative explanation. What is happening? The first person which is experienced, which is happening within our within ourselves all the time, which we call our inner life. How do you explain that? Somebody said in neuroscience. Consciousness studies is a big thing now, very good. It's, they have started seriously thinking about it in the last 10, 20 years. They said, we don't even have good questions yet. And we, are, we are unable to frame the questions. The theory, one scientist told me, the theories we have are not even wrong. You can say right theory, wrong theory. There's some criteria to judge. We are at sea, we don't know. We are not even wrong. There's something way below that. Right and wrong, at least you have some idea where you are going. We, we don't know anything about consciousness so far, really. So, re modesty, the intelligence, oh, ashanta, even lack of faith, that can be, is as much of a proof of this as anything else. Dhriti, patience, determination, focus, it happens in the light of your consciousness. Itara, Lack of patience, restlessness. I have a terribly restless mind. Can I practice Vedanta? Obviously I cannot practice meditation. With a terribly restless mind, meditation won't work straight away. But Vedanta, yes it says, you have a restless mind. In what light? Who is the witness of the restless mind? The more restless, the better. <laughs> Gives you more opportunity to practice. It reminds me of Raman Maharshi, who was asked, am I qualified to practice Vedanta? Because if you look at a traditional Vedanta text, the list of qualifications is daunting. <laughs> you must have Viveka, the real and the unreal, the, the um, eternal and the non-eternal. You must be able to discriminate, discern the two. Vairagya, dispassion for everything in the world. But that seems a tall order. <laughs> I do like my um, chocolate chip cookie. <laughs> the world is my cho chocolate chip cookie. <laughs> How can I give that up? And the six-fold discipline, each tougher than the uh, earlier one. And finally, an intense desire to be free. And so sort of scratch out heads. I have a little bit of a desire to be free, but not very intense. <laughs> it's strong enough to bring me here, but so can I practice Vedanta? Am I qualified for Vedanta? And Raman Maharshi says, did you say I? Then you are qualified. Yeah. Oh. If you can say I, because his method was who am I? Anybody who can say I, I don't care what comes after that. I am English or German or Indian. Uh, I am a believer, non-believer. I am a good man or a bad man <laughs> or whatever. I don't care. If you can say I, you are qualified for Vedanta. Dream, modesty, that also shines in the light of consciousness. The intellect, understanding, pee, fear, caution, all of these are functions of the mind, things which come up in, the, in your mind, in our minds all the time. 
इति एवम आदि एंड सच अदर थिंग्स भाषयत के कथा इट रिवील्स कॉन्शियसनेस हियर द फेमिनिन इज यूज्ड चिति नॉर्मली द वर्ड वी कम अक्रॉस इज चित चित मींस प्योर कॉन्शियसनेस हियर द फेमिनिन इज यूज्ड चिति प्योर कॉन्शियसनेस illumines all these thoughts feelings ideas emotions perceptions whatever we call our inner life all of them are conscious right by our principles that consciousness which illumines the mind is the seer and the mind becomes the seen the two must be separate you are not your mind you don't even have to think all the time it's so strange we can't stop the mind from thinking <laughs> somebody said when people shoot themselves you know commit suicide tragic cases often they shoot themselves in the head and the reason is they say they want that voice in the head to stop <laughs> but how strange we have we have legs it's like i have legs so i must keep walking all the time why because i have legs no you don't have to keep walking all the time or running around all the time because you have legs they are instruments motor organs just because i have a tongue i don't have to keep talking all the time <laughs> just because i have a mind i don't have to keep thinking all the time the mind can stop so all of this all the thoughts of the mind and the silence of the mind too is illumined by the same unchanging consciousness it is separate from the mind it is one the mind is filled with many thoughts and feelings and ideas and it is relatively un it is unchanging and the mind is changing very fast somebody said we have about 16000 discrete thoughts in one waking day <clears throat> of course they are not original independent separate thoughts then we would be the greatest genius who ever lived or a raving lunatic it's mostly thoughts which are repetitive habits habitual thoughts but thought patterns not very useful mostly garbage but it's repeated again and again and again so it changes the consciousness illumining them does not change fifth verse no deti nastamitesha no deti nastamitesha na vriddhim yati nakshayam स्वयं विभात्य साधन विभा which neither rises nor sets it is ever shining navriddhim yati nakshaya it is not like uh, the moon which goes through phases of the moon vriddhi means expansion shaya means uh, reduction this consciousness neither increases nor decreases swayam vibhati it shines itself adhanyami and everything else shines in its light everything else thoughts sense organs body universe it shines in the light of your consciousness for you at least after all how is this universe experienced by you except in your consciousness beautiful upanishadic verses kato upanishad munda upanishad na natra suryo bhati na chandra karakam nema vidyuto bhanti kuto yamati swami vivekananda was fond of quoting this in this country and in the in other western countries also he would chant it and translate where the sun does not shine where the moon does not shine neither the stars nor the lightning where what to speak of this mere mortal fire tameva bhantam anubhati sarva that shining everything else shines tasya bhasha bhasa sarvam idam vibhati by its light everything is lit up experience it in that way experience yourself experience yourself in that way you are the light in which your mind shines through the mind you the light you are illumining your body with its sense organs 
through the mind and sense organs. You, that light, you are illumining the whole world. You say, no Swami, I can't even illumine this room. <laughs> some fish are there with glow. What do you think, I am some kind of a glow worm or something? I don't know, it doesn't mean a physical light. See, the world is being illumined by the sun, look outside, really. And who is experiencing the world illumined by the sun? You are. In what light? Not the sunlight. In your light. Fall asleep at this moment, the world goes dark for you. Think of your consciousness, your real nature, that witness as a light. Not a physical light. It's called the light of lights. Every day we are singing here, Kandana Bhavabandha. At the end it comes, Jyoti Rajyoti. Look at the words. The light of lights shining deep within our minds. Exactly what they are talking about here. That light shining within your mind. You are that light. Swami, we are speaking about God here. True. What does that mean? What does it point to? That reality, the witness consciousness within you and what we worship as God in religion are one and the same thing. That is the meaning of Aham Brahmasmi. I am Brahm. Not the body, it is the seeing. Not the mind, it is the seeing. The seer of body and mind. In one of the hymns to Sri Ramakrishna, it is beautiful Sanskrit. And you can immediately relate to it now. The Sanskrit goes like this. Buddhescha Sakshi Yoveti Sakalam Nachayasya Vetra. Who is Ramakrishna or Krishna or Jesus or any avatar or God or whatever deity? What is that? Buddhescha Sakshi, the witness of my intellect. That which shines in my intellect. Yoveti Sakalam, that which knows everything. All that I know is known by that. Nachayasya Vetta, who cannot be known by anything else. The fourth quarter, the witness is never becomes an object of knowledge. Yes. We saw at the end. Nachayasya Vetta, one who cannot be known by anything. There is no other, there, there is literally translates as, there is no other knower for this. It is the only knower. In the Brihadaranek Upanishad, the Rishi sings, Vigyataram are kena vijanyat. By what will you, my child, know the knower? So is it unknown? Not at all. It is you yourself. You know yourself not as an object of knowledge, but by being yourself. And then you shine out into the world, into the mind and through the mind and body into the world. Alright. So this is the fifth verse. Swayam vivatya sanyani bhaseyed. Sadhanam vina, without any instrument. To see something you need the instrument of the eyes and the mind. To see the eyes you need the instrument of the mind. But to see the mind directly, the consciousness does not need an instrument. It shines upon the mind. It illumines without instrument. Sadhanam vina. Before we go on to the sixth verse, Keeping track of the time? 5 plus 5. 5 plus 5. Yeah, 5 plus 5. Now, I will draw a diagram. Learn this diagram well. Here is the lodge where we are staying. lake and forests and the trees and the waters of the lake, Loom Lake. And here we are, here is my body, I, which I call myself, and here is, here is the mind, the thoughts, and here is what we call the Witness consciousness. Mm -hmm. 
This is the witness. Now, this is the gross body. By gross body, I'm not saying that you're obese, just physical. <laughs> Whatever you can see is, is what is meant by gross body. It's a Sanskrit translation of the stola. You, you might be the skinniest person on earth, but that's still the gross body because you can see it, you can, you can weigh it. And in comparison to that, now I will replace the term mind with subtle body. But I always mean the mind. Subtle body, mind or subtle body. Because mind is an imprecise term. In Sanskrit, in Vedanta, you have several terms which cover that. Manas means the thinking faculty. Buddhi means the understanding faculty. Chitta means the memory. Ahankara means the ego. All of them together is what we call in English mind. So subtle body is a better way of putting it. It's also a body. And here is the word. The sky, the mountains, the lake, and the lodge, and, and so on. Trees and animals and plants. This is what we have learned. Up to this, the world outside, my physical body, this belongs to a public world which everybody can see. You can, we can see each other, the body, and we can see the objects in the world. It's a shared world for us. All of us experience the same thing. But from here onwards, it's a private world. Unless the other person is a telepath, can't see into your mind. Um, so the mind, subtle body, but you are aware of your own mind. The moment you just need to look in and you can feel your thoughts, memories. So the mind, and there are thoughts and feelings and memories and all. I'm showing them as waves in the mind. Up to this part, up to the mind, we know all this. Vedanta has not told us anything important. It just pointed out what is the labeled it, our experience of the world. What Vedanta has taught us today is this. The very possibility of this. That there is something apart from the mind. Something which makes the mind an object. Till now we had we thought of who am I? This feeling I is a thought in the mind. Just say I in your mind, you will see it's a thought in the mind. Say 2 plus 2 is equal to 4, it's a thought in the mind. Just repeat I silently, it's a thought in the mind. So I, this is in English it's called ego. And in Sanskrit, ahamkar. It's a function of the mind. It's not you. Vedanta tells us something radical, simple but powerful. The I is not you. It's a function in the mind. It's a thought in the mind. When you do not think I, are you not there? Of course you are there. You are just not saying I. When I fall asleep, is nobody there? We think it might be so it's blank. But then where do you come back from? So there is something to experience the blankness of deep sleep. The consciousness which makes this I an object and all other thoughts an object. This is what we learned from Vedanta today. This is the witness. Apply what we learned. Stage one. Four stages. Stage one. Everything is formed here and the I is the seer. The eyes are separate from the seen. Now the eyes themselves and all other sense organs in the body, indeed the whole body is the seen. The mind is the seer. Second stage. The mind itself, all the thoughts, feelings, good and bad in the mind, they are experienced. By whom? By the witness. The mind is the seen and the witness is the seer. That's the third stage. And the witness itself can never become an object of knowledge. Why not? To become an object of knowledge, it must be either something that you can see with the eyes or hear with the ears or smell with the nose or touch with the you know, five sense organs. Or it must be something you can think about with the mind. But the consciousness is beyond both body and mind. It can never become an object. Rather, whatever you think about is an object to consciousness. Whatever you see is an object to consciousness. 
Consciousness itself never comes on the other, other side of the diagram. It's, somebody said it's like seeing everything with a torchlight and you want to know the source of this wonderful light. And you take the battery out and try to put it in front of the light. It'll never work. Light will go out. You see it's behind the light. Try to swivel the light around. The battery has gone behind the light. You'll never be able to illuminate. It's, it's a rough example, but not a bad example. So this is the diagram we should be aware of. Another common question might be, are we becoming less and less? I mean, earlier I was, here is a mind and a body and quite possibly a consciousness. Now you are saying I'm not the body, I'm not the mind, I am only this consciousness. Haven't, haven't I become less? No. Why we have not become less? It will become clearer as the days go by, but very simply, the way Vedanta sees it is, this consciousness is infinite and unchanging. It is being limited by the mind and further limited by the body. And then only we get our this present experience. In itself, it is much vaster than what we feel it to be right now. And we'll see a little more reason why it is we are not limiting ourselves. Rather, when we realize ourselves as witness, we are actually coming into our real infinite nature. We'll see how that works. Also another doubt, if I realize myself as the witness, will I still be able to think and see and hear? Of course. Why not? It's the same consciousness which enables you to hear now, to see now, to think now, to do all the activities now. Why will you not be able to do it when you realize yourself to be the consciousness? You can still use the mind and the body, you will still do that. All right. So this diagram is a very nice tool for illustrating what we have learned. One more thing you need to know about the diagram is it's, it's, it's mostly wrong. <laughs> this, this is not the way it is. I have drawn this diagram just for the sake of explanation. Rather, a better diagram would be, but it won't be clear now, but but it's good to know that. A better diagram would be that consciousness which we are speaking about, the Sakshi, is actually something like this. It encompasses everything. This is Sakshi or otherwise known as Brahma. But we don't know it that yet. You, if I do that now, you'll say, Swami, so far we were moving with reason and experience, more or less. Now you're suddenly making a big claim. So I'm not going to do that now. But this is the, a better picture. This is what ultimately we're going towards. You see, for those who are interested in Indian philosophy, in the philosophy of Sankhya and Yoga, they stop when they have isolated you as pure consciousness from the body, mind and the rest of the world. You are pure consciousness, she is pure consciousness, I am pure consciousness. And indeed, they say they are separate pure consciousness. We are not one. We are separate like stars in the sky. The German philosopher Leibniz, he spoke of monads. You know, like shining points in the firmament of the night ever isolated from each, eternally isolated from each other, shining in their own glory. It's a beautiful way of, a uh, beautiful description of what Sankhya and Yoga think. You are consciousness eternally apart from material nature. Material nature is not just matter and energy out there, it's also mind, thought, that's all material nature. Our problem is we have become mixed up with that, if you can separate yourself from that, you'll be free. Indeed, the word used for freedom in Sankhya is Kaivalya. It translates as aloneness. Not loneliness. It's not that you are free in the Sankhya sense when you are very lonely. No. You're, it's a, it's a ma magnificent aloneness. With al aloneness with a capital A. Meister Eckhart, the German mystic. I think it was Eckhart. Or oh, who was it? Or St. John. Who, who said define spirituality as the flight of the alone to the alone. Mm. Eckhart? I swear Eckhart. Alone to the alone. Alone, small a. 
which is what we are. If you think about it, don't think about it. It'll, it'll throw you into depression. <laughs> we only th think we are in company, but we are completely isolated from every, each of us. Our own private lives are entirely our inner lives. We can never really reach out and touch another person, except through these crude mediums of flesh and blood. We are alone. Alone when we are born, throughout life, every night when we dream, we dream alone. In the vast world conjured up by our minds, which we call dreams, are we not alone? We seem to have so many people. So many people are having a nice time if it's a nice dream. Or so many people harassing us and troubling us if it's a nightmare. The fact is there's nobody else there in our dreams except ourselves. It's true. The story of a pandit in the Himalayas, of a Swami in fact. He went to, um, he studied under a great pandit. And he says that one day I went to the pandit's house and he was sitting very depressed. What happened? The pandit says, I have never been defeated in debate earlier, but last night I was defeated. I'm terribly depressed. Oh, what happened? Who defeated you? We never heard of this. Well, you wouldn't have heard. I went to sleep and in my dream this other pandit came and challenged me. And I went into this debate, I can't remember the details of this debate, it so happens in dreams. You know, you come and stumble across a great idea or a poem or a novel which will change the literary landscape and if you wake up you don't remember anything. <laughs> so, we had this tremendous debate and I lost. So, I have lost for the first time in my life and the Swami said, Well sir, that Pandit also was you. In your dream, all the people there are not you. Your friends are you, your enemies are you and everybody else is you. In our dreams, we are completely alone. And when dreams cease in the darkness of deep sleep, we are well and truly alone. We don't even have our thoughts to accompany us, not even the mind. And what Vedanta tells us, even when we are awake in the midst of all of this, we are exactly like that, completely alone. There is nobody else except you. But don't think about that. <laughs> Now, Eckhart says, spirituality is a flight of the alone to the alone. Which alone? This spark of consciousness, Sakshi. Which alone? Brahman, the consciousness underlying the entire universe. And what is this flight? If you are a dualist, a devotee, a bhakta, this alone is my lord, I am, I am thy lover, thy servant, thy devotee and I shall live eternally in thy light. That's the devotee's approach. If you are a qualified non-dualist, Vishishta Advaita, then I am thy part, let me be absorbed, I am a beam of sunlight, you are the entire sun, let me be absorbed in thee. That is fulfillment. If you are the non-dualist, Advaita, this is not just a flight, it's a recognition that I am this. When I realize myself as this, this alone disappears. I am the capital. Uh, alone with the capital A. I am that. But not just you. Every one of us is. Everybody is. That's, that's, the, uh, that's what non-dual Vedanta is telling us. Now we are going far afield. We have some time. Um, should I go on to the next topic? Do you have a question at this stage? Yes. I do have a question. The mind to the city. The sort of thing is low to the city. Yeah. It's like in the brain. She's in the brain. But she's not asking. Is it really there? The mind? Yeah. Okay. Um, according to Vedanta, the mind is really there. There, where, here in this very physical body. It's, I'm showing it for purpose of understanding like a ghostly something floating apart from the physical body but is actually pervading the physical body. It acts through our nervous system. The Vedantic idea is, physical matter is one kind of matter, called gross matter. And the mind, intellect, emotions, memory, they are formed of another kind of matter called subtle matter. In Sanskrit, Tangmatra. Sukshma Buddha, subtle matter, which science has not yet come to. Uh, so, it's very difficult to locate the mind in science. They are forever trying to reduce it to the brain. 
Now, is the brain related to the mind? Yes, it is. Very intimately so. But as an instrument through which it functions. So, Vedanta says when the body is destroyed, and it will be destroyed at death, the mind is set free from the body. Mind means a subtle body. And it transmigrates to other bodies. When we say going from birth to death, to death to another birth, going to different worlds and coming, you know, being reincarnated. reincarnated. In Hinduism, punar janma, rebirth, again and again and again. Um, this is what moves. The body is destroyed. You leave the body back here. And pure consciousness, where will it move? Pure consciousness is always there. This is the one which moves from one body to another, from one world to another. Pure consciousness is all pervading. I had a question. I, yes. I don't quite know what to frame it, but it seems like many times I've, I've dreamt and then got into other people's dreams, or I've gotten on the planes where I realize I'm intruding on some other flow of consciousness that isn't, isn't my consciousness. Right. Now, as a Vedantin, we must make, get into the habit of making a distinction between consciousness and the flow of thought. If what we call the flow of consciousness, or in literature the stream of consciousness, is actually flow of thought, stream of thought. Consciousness, you can see in this model, consciousness does not flow. Consciousness is unchangeably is. It is, it, it just is, it shines forth. What flows is thought. What changes is thought. The stream of thought. So our language, you have to be careful, because our language has been modeled upon our day-to-day -day lives. It has not been designed to express non-duality. That's why when we use language to express these thoughts, often we run into contradictions and paradoxes. You will find often in non-dualistic texts in the Upanishads, paradoxes are used to express something. Higher than the highest, lower than the lowest, greater than the greatest, further than the furthest, nearer than the nearest. That which is beyond the known and beyond the unknown. What do you mean by that? In the Gita, he knows the secret of action, who sees action in inaction, and inaction in action. <laughs> Whatever does that mean? <laughs> sounds, as the younger generation would say, it sounds cool, but, <laughs> but what does it mean? There is a reason for that. And if you are interested in that whole aspect, how language deals with non-duality or fails to deal with non-duality, I refer you to my talk. It's on YouTube, on the Vedanta Society of Southern California website. The Advaita Vedanta and the uh, language of paradox. The language of paradox. It, it, the language of paradox. Advaita Vedanta and the language of paradox. You can just search on YouTube, you'll get it. It's just over one hour and it deals with this question. What, is, what are the themes which are dealt with there? It's interesting. Why does language fail to express Brahman or Atman? We are, we are forever being told that it cannot be expressed in language. It is beyond words. We even sing every day to, to Lord. Vakya Manatita, beyond thought and beyond language. But why? After all, why, why can't language express it? Why can't you speak about Brahman or God? Aren't we forever speaking about it? What, what do the Swamis do other than speak about Brahman? <laughs> so, so how is it that language fails to express? And uh, I'll come to you. So in that talk I deal with what language can do and why it cannot express Brahman. And how do the Upanishads and the scriptures, which are basically language, how do they get around this problem? How do they still manage to express Brahman? That's where the idea of paradoxes and contradictions come in. Use this paradox, deliberately is using paradox, not to confuse you, not to give trouble to you, but to get around this problem that language cannot express in Brahman. Yes, there's a, there's a question there. I have a practical question. Uh, all the chanting we've been doing from this uh, text, do you have this somewhere on YouTube also? Like, I want to pick up the, uh, you know, pick up the chanting. That, um, not separately, 
but I did this uh, text, I taught this text quite recently after coming to Hollywood. So the whole Drink Drishya Viveka is there in 12 lectures. It's worthwhile to go and take a look at that. In YouTube you can find that. We are doing it a little differently in this retreat. Mm -hmm. In YouTube it was done, it was like more like a series of formal talks. But where can I get this then? I want to learn it. <laughs> it will be in YouTube. It will be in YouTube. Okay. Yeah, but Hopefully. it's not, it's there. I've done the same chanting okay. there on YouTube. Okay. The only thing is, it's not in one place. It's scattered across 12 right, lectures. Right, right, well, that, yeah, okay. You can get it again and again there, Thank in YouTube. You. Thank you. And I, and yes, there's a question there. Actually, there are three questions. Is that okay, Morad? Start with one. <laughs> this is from the morning. We had a meet, uh, all of us got together and tried to sort it out as yeah. you have taught us. So, three questions is, does the witness have an active role in the uh, flow of the mind? That's the first question. What is the relationship between the witness and the mind? And then who holds the responsibility for the right action and thought? Right. Very good questions, all of them. The second one, that what is the relationship between the witness, let me go back to the earlier diagram, then we can speak about it more comfortably. No, this is the real, in Sanskrit they say vastu stiti. The state of reality is this, but we cannot use this for classes. So we have to take the witness and put it here. So the, the novices in the monastery in Belurmat, the young men, although they are all monks, but they are also like any young people, they are mischievous also. So when they say, where is Brahman or where is Atman? See, on the, they say, it's usually on the left side of the board in Sarvapyana in this class. <laughs> it's to the left, look to the left. Here's the witness. So one of the questions was, what is the relationship between the witness and the mind? Here is the mind, the what is the relationship the between the The flow of the mind. As the flow of the mind. But the first question was, can it control the mind? Uh, yes. it's, does it have an active role? Does it have an active role in controlling the mind? Okay. And third one was, who is responsible for right and wrong? Yes, for the right action. Very deep yeah. questions. You have an uh, additional question here? No, but well, I'll follow. I don't want to All right. Each of these could be a lecture in itself. In fact, the second one is the topic, you're right on track, because the second question is exactly what they'll talk about now. The first question is, does it have an active role? No. What do you mean? The witness, we are using an English word, witness is usually, witnessing is an act, so usually. But here it does not mean an act. It's more like the sun which shines continuously. It's not doing anything deliberately. It's more like the magnet which is there, and because of the magnetic field, the iron filings whirl around it. But it is not deliberately doing anything. It means you. Does it have no role? Oh, it has the most important role. Most important role is because of its existence, the mind can function. Because of its existence, because of its light, the mind and the sense organs function. Everything that we do in life, religious and worldly, good and bad, sublime and ridiculous, everything that we do in the world is because of the light of the witness. Otherwise, we couldn't do anything. So that is the role. In fact, it's all roles in one sense. Does, yeah. Shanti, does it, we were discussing this in the afternoon, does it influence the mind? No. Yes. Uh, it's, where we it's not a conscious. Sorry. Remember, the witness is not like a little man sitting on the top of a big machine and controlling the machine. No, you know, you have seen these huge cranes. They'll have a little box at the top where a man is sitting and controlling the crane, pressing the buttons. The witness is not like a little person. There is a word for that, homunculus. Sitting in the mind here in the headquarters and controlling everything. There is nothing like that. There is only this all-pervading consciousness which shines on the mind. But let me, I'll go to this, the next two verses and we'll see something interesting happening. Yes. So, well, consciousness is that eyeball up in the upper left. Yeah. Consciousness? <laughs> is, is that? It's a big eye. Yeah. Yeah. No, could you, yeah, it's a big yeah. <laughs> could you, uh, is, is there any, what, what, what might be the connection or disconnection between in Buddhism practicing awareness? 
as I would say, practicing awareness of the moment is one. And would it have any relationship to the non yar who am I? Yes. Um, um, or is it even worth is it even my, going into? No, uh, it, it's really worth going into, but I'll uh, hold myself back because that's a full talk. Now I'll do. I'll take the uh, route of compromise. My first impulse is to say to put it off so that we can discuss it later. But then I would like to say something right now. If we do get around to discussing it in detail later, that's great. But right now I'd like to say this. Okay. The Buddhist approach, at least one school of Buddhism, there are many, many schools of Buddhism, but one school and maybe the mainstream school of Buddhist philosophy called the school of Shunyavada. Madhyamaka Shunyavada, which is the central philosophy of Tibetan Buddhism. Also the central philosophy of most Mahayana schools. They are very close to non-dual Vedanta. Apparently not, because they deny the existence of God. Here Swami, you are talking about a permanent unchanging consciousness. They deny this very same thing. They say that there is no permanent unchanging self. There is no permanent unchanging self. You can talk of consciousness, but they will say it's a series of flashes of consciousness. They call it Kshanika Vijnana. Apparently so. You go a bit further, then what are they talking about when you see what Nagarjuna, the greatest philosopher of the Shunyavada school, how he defines Shunya. Shunya literally, in Sanskrit word Shunya means zero, the void. And you go to Mandukya Karika and look at the definition of Brahman. Brahman is the infinite. Apparently they are on absolutely on the two different ends of the spectrum. Nothingness and everything. How can they be the same? But when you look at the definitions, you will find that incredible. When you say, how does Nagarjuna define Shunya? He says, it is not the ultimate thing which we are talking about, Tattvam. It's not something which exists. So it does not exist. It is not something which does not exist. Right. He says, <laughs> na sat, na asat. Not that it exists. Oh, so it does not exist. Not that it does not exist. <laughs> so it both exists and not uh, does not exist. Yeah. Not that it both exists and does not exist. <laughs> so it does not exist and not not exist. Not even that. This code calls it Chatush Koti Vinir Mukta Tattvam. What I am speaking about is it transcends the four logical alternatives. Exists? No. Does not exist? No. Both exists and does not exist? No. Neither exists, neither does not exist? No. <laughs> and the, almost the very same terms are used by Gaudapada to refer to Brahman. Because you see, it's a good point, good time to make this point. But, Wait. But that sounds like a coin almost. Almost to rally. Yes. Like, like a Wait, wait, wait. Just hold on. <laughs> It's a good time to make this point then. How much time do we have? Not much time. But I'll just make it a point here. Though I have drawn it in this way, look at this. The mountains in right behind you, the lake and the lodge we're sitting in, and our bodies. These are things, objects. And when you look inside, even the mind which you feel just now, all of us, that's also kind of a thing. Because it's an object of your knowledge. It's an object of our knowledge. We are aware of it. But that which is aware of all of these things, that consciousness, that witness, is not a thing. Number one. And number two, equally important, it is not nothing. It is like this. These are the two things we can understand. A thing, and nothing. No thing is denied. No thing. 
these are the two things we can understand. There is something or there is nothing. These are the two things we can understand. What Advaita Vedanta is telling you, it's not nothing. There is something called Brahman. And what Buddhism, Nagarjuna is telling you, that is not a thing. Then where do you land? What, do you, what conclusion can you, can you draw from it? You take both and you end up with no thing. <laughs> what is Brahman the witness? It's not a thing. It's not nothing. It's no thing. Sounds profound, but what is that? It's you. What are you? Are you a thing? You are not an object of your knowledge or anybody else's knowledge. Right now. Swami, you can see me. Or can't you? You can see your body. You can see your own thoughts. But the one which is seeing your own thoughts from inside, is it a thing? It's not a thing. Is it nothing? Then you wouldn't exist. There is a long discussion on this by Vidyaranya at the end of the third chapter of Panchadashi, where he says the two greatest obstacles for understanding, just understanding, let alone realizing, understanding the non-dual self is a tendency to either try to see it as a thing or when we realize you cannot see it as a thing, to dismiss it as nothing. No. It is the only reality, but it's not a thing. But all objects are things. All objects are things. Things to whom? Things to this consciousness. All right. I think we have run out of time. Almost. What's the definition of nothing? I understand the definition this, of nothing. Uh, What's the definition of nothing? Technically, it would be an absence of the thing. Which is what? Of anything. For example, when I say there is a glass on this table, there is something on this table. Yes. When I remove this glass, now you are entitled to say there is no glass on the table. That's true. That no glass on the table, is an, that absence of glass is a nothing. Well, it's the absence of glass, but there is still something there. Sure. But we don't know. You, 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 are, you are speaking about, you are speaking like a Vedantin. Yes. And the, Vedant, the Buddhist would be deeply unhappy with you. <laughs> but the Vedantins would be happy with you. Yes, there's still something there. So there's a yeah. difference between no thing and nothing. Yeah. There's a difference. There's a difference. Yeah. It's no thing. It's the infinite consciousness, the subject, is not an object. It's not a thing. But it's not nothing either. We, we, if you want, I can go into that. It says Nirguna Gunamai, what Yes. The now, if, just look at the Nirguna Gunamai. This consciousness is Nirgun. But when working through the mind and body right now, as this person sitting there is Gunamai. If you can be Nirguna Gunamai, why can't Thakur be Nirguna Gunamai? Each of us is Nirguna Guna. Nirguna means beyond all description and quality. Am I beyond description and quality? Am I that bad, Swami? <laughs> no. You are that transcendent, that consciousness. And do, all, do qualities and descriptions apply to me? Yes, it does. From the point of view of your body, of your mind, qualities and descriptions apply to you. But it's the qualities and descriptions of a jiva. Where is the qualities and descriptions of Ishwar? As Nirguna, this question should come. As Nirguna, I and Sri Ramakrishna and Krishna and Rama and Jesus are we the same? Yes. Then we are not alone. We are all one. So the witness is not Jiva. The witness in itself, question, is the witness Jiva? Yes and no. Now you can answer these questions. I will throw them back at you. Is the witness Jiva? No. It is the witness of the Jiva. When you become free, you do not become free. You become free of, of yourself. The little person which I am will never become free. I will realize I am free of this little person. It will continue until death of this body. But I am eternally free of this little person. Don't worry about this little person. Swami, does the world make sense to you? Oh, yes. <laughs> as Brahman, as the reality underlying this world, everything makes sense. Without it, nothing makes sense. 
All right. You asked a question. Are you Jeeva? Uh, is the witness Jeeva? No. And next. Yes. Because who else is Jeeva but the witness? Is God everybody? No. God is God. Then who is everybody? None other than God. <coughs> Mary Hale, Swami Vivekananda's disciple, mm -hmm. she wrote a poem to him saying that I have understood what you have taught, that all is God. And he wrote back a scathing poem saying that I have never taught such strange doctrine <laughs> that all is God. Unmeaning talk. He says, unmeaning talk. And she was surprised. You yourself said it. God is all, you have said it. God is everything. So I Vivekananda wrote back, what I have said is, God alone is, the all is not. Only this exists. We will understand in, in time to come, not right now. Because right now it seems to be a separate thing. When we see the underlying reality, it's like saying, all the waves in the lake and the bubbles and all, and water. Well, compared to the water, and with respect to the water, there are no waves, bubbles, nothing. It's all water only. So you can't say water is everything, or you can say none of those things is the water. Because they, have, they have no existence of their own apart from the water. Is there a reality here? Yes. Are these things real in themselves? No. We have forgotten the reality behind all these things. In fact, Ramana Maharshi says something very strange. Yes. Who can say the world is real? He says only the enlightened person can say the world is real. We say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Doesn't the enlightened person say Brahman is real and the world is false? He says, no, only the student of Vedanta says the world is false. <laughs> it is the worldly man who says the world is real. Brahman is a theory. God is a matter of faith. The world is real. That's ignorance. And if the enlightened person says, the world, Brahman is this world, or Bra world is nothing other than Brahman. In that sense, the world is real, because it's Brahman only. It's only the Vedantic student in the middle, that's us. We say Brahman is real and the world is false. As if there are two things. We have to go through this phase, otherwise the reality of Brahman will not become apparent to us. Right? The transition has to be made. But we are running far ahead of ourselves. <laughs> we have, uh, but it will make it easy to uh, go on to the next part. Should we stop now? No. No yes. more. Yes? <laughs> we can just break up into informal groups now. Om Shanti 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 Hari That is why when Buddha's student Ananda asked him, or Sariputra I think, asked him, is there a self, Atman? The Buddha said, have I said that there is a self? So the student said, so there is no self. Did I say that there is no self? He's confused. It's either this or the that. You see? Now instead of saying such things, the Buddha took a different track. The student asked, then what do you teach? Then what, what have you said? Buddha said, see if a person is hunting in the forest, or a person in the forest he gets hit by an arrow, and you come to rescue him, and instead of calling the doctor, the person says, first of all find out what wood this arrow is made of, what is the cast of the person who shot this arrow, and what poison is on the tip of the what would you say to such a person? I would say he's a fool. He will die before he knows all these things. <laughs> similarly, O monk, Buddha says, similarly, O monk, I, the Tathagata, is the name of the Buddha. I teach that there is suffering, there is a cause of suffering, there is an end to suffering, and there is a way out of suffering. That's all I teach. Because he's right. Anything you attempt to say is liable to be misinterpreted. 